very excited about this panel, actually, because um, I am a huge fan of this, uh, this adaptation. I was a huge fan of the books, and I think I always kind of thought, nobody's ever going to be able to put this on screen properly, and they have, I think. They've really pulled it off. Um, so uh, we've had two, su two series so far, and there is the third and final one coming up um, in the autumn. Can't wait. So uh, fans will know that the uh, main antagonist, the baddie, <laughs> is Mrs. Coulter. Glamorous, power-hungry, and ruthless. We also know that there are two sides to Mrs. Coulter. There is, of course, her and her demon, the golden monkey, um, a sort of alter ego or extension of her personality in animal form. We, we, we'll, we will discuss which and how um, in, this, uh, uh, in this panel. Um, so it, Ruth and the three people on the stage actually created Mrs. Coulter. It's been very much a kind of a, a group effort. Um, before we start talking, let's see some of Mrs. Coulter's most memorable moments from the first two series. Here's the first clip. Lyra, this is Mrs. Coulter. I am not used to the grandeur of this at all. <laughs> I can teach you to wield power over all of them. What a lovely surprise. Hello, girls. When every child's nightmare, there's an element of truth. <laughs> Stop that! You're hurting us! Lyra. Tell me where she is, or I will destroy all of this. We cannot allow this woman to take control. Tear everything apart! You used to want to change the world. Come with me and we will change them all. You are not, nor have you ever been my equal. You love her. We have to do whatever it takes to keep her safe. Fantastic stuff. But so, Ruth, let's start with who is Mrs. Coulter on the page, and how did you go about, you know, bringing her her to life? So when I was first asked to do this, I hadn't actually read the books, which, uh, to my shame, and um, I didn't know who Mrs. Coulter was. So I started reading the books and just fell in love with her instantly. And it, I'm sure many of you have read the books. And she remains, I, I loved her because she remains a mystery on the page. She is obviously horrific <laughs> in many ways. Um, and she, the way she's described as being sort of, a cesspit of moral filth. And uh, I thought, well, that's really exciting to play. <laughs> you know me and my parts. So um, I, I sort of, and reading further, you think, wow, there's actually a really interesting dynamic with her, with these demons. And that's why the books are so unique. And why I was drawn to them was because there is, they are one of the same thing, her monkey and Mrs. Coulter. And so I thought in exploring this character, I had to explore both those characters and to work out how they're yin and yang or how they are symbiotic. And I thought that was a real challenge, not only in working on the day with uh, special effects and all sorts, but actually in the psychology of the, who this human is. Um, and I love the fact that she's an iconic villain. She's sort of beautiful and glamorous uh, and horrific and cruel. But there's, by the book three, if you know book three, she becomes heroic. So I, there's a journey, a huge journey to play. So there's all those things really excited me. Um, and I thought, I'd never done fantasy before as well. So I thought there's real freedom in fantasy to explore those things. Because you, I mean, usually a, an actor builds a, a character you know, sort of pretty much on their own with all the writer and the director. Uh, but creating Mrs. Coulter has been a very different process, hasn't it? Because of the monkey. Yeah, and I didn't quite realize that until probably two weeks before we started shooting. I suddenly, <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, so I started doing my usual work, which is going through the book, pulling out what Phillips, using Phillips words and story and characterization as in inspiration. Um, and then of course, when you're building a character on every set, you do work with a costume, costume designer and makeup artist and the writers um, in the early stages. But then of course you have this other added character uh, who is with you all the time and in the book it felt like this character was different to others the demon the monkey was not only vicious and cruel and mean um, but didn't speak 
didn't have a name. I thought this is really fascinating. It's clues to who Mrs. Coulter is. That she has she hasn't named her demon. She has, doesn't speak to it or doesn't allow it to speak. So there's something really fascinating in her own psyche wrapped up in that. And I knew that we would have to be, I wanted that to be the center of who she is. And so I knew I'd have to be working alongside not only on the day, again, with a puppeteer, but also it's going to be how it's perceived on the screen at the end and how that's created by Russell at the end um, with the monkey that you all guys see. So it was a really, I realized how collaborative this was going to be. And actually that really excited me even more because... I don't know, it's just, it's much more thrilling to be working and have friends working on it with you and coming up with ideas. Well, let, let's talk about the look of it first, because I mean, I think it looks absolutely fabulous. And then that's partly due to, 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 to Caroline McCall's work as a costume supervisor. So, uh, uh, Caroline, uh, um, let, you know, let's start from the, from the outside in and, and, and talk through the process of creating um, the, the, the look. And I just want to read a a quote from Philip Pullman when he describes Mrs. Coulter. She was beautiful and young. Her sleek back hair framed her cheeks. She had an air of glamour <laughs> that, Lyra was, <laughs> that Lyra was entranced. She could hardly take her eyes off her. So, I mean, where do you, you know, you, you, you see that on the page. Where do you then look for inspiration to recreate that uh, visually? Well, for me, you know, that statement just led me to old Hollywood glamour and looking at all the icons of um, the golden age of Hollywood. So, you know, Marlena Dietrich, Grace Kelly, Catherine Hepburn, um, you know, a myriad of these amazing women who um, was all about their appearance. And then when Ruth was cast, then I was trying to draw, draw a similarity between Ruth and, and who Mrs. Coulter would be. And then that led me to Hedy Lamar, who at the time in her career, was seen as the most beautiful woman in Hollywood. Um, she would walk in a room and it would stop, and that's the kind of effect that Mrs. Coulter had to have. Also, having a golden monkey as your demon means that you're never gonna hide in the shadows, you're always gonna command the room, you're always gonna command attention. But what we found very interesting about Hedy Lamarr was that this beauty was a facade really for what she was really interested in. She was a, um, a scientist and inventor and she invented a telecommunication system with radio waves um, for, for missiles but was never recognized for that. And that invention led to Wi-Fi. Um, and so there's this side to Mrs. Coulter as well, this glamour and um, then the intelligence. And it's a powerful behind. look, isn't it? I mean, we look at that and look at those shoulders and so on. I mean, there's... Yes, and there's also, there's a sort of softness about Hedy mm -hmm. as well that we liked. Um, this, she has famously has the center parting and the soft hair. And she, you know, not the kind of hardness of Marlene Dietrich, perhaps, or some other Hollywood stars. There's something um, that you'd be drawn to and appealing about her, which was also really important. So she was my main, um, who I mainly drew on at the beginning of the process. And then we kind of peppered as we would go through the series, different kind of icons of Hollywood. And, and what sort of world were you going for? I mean, how do the costumes reflect the social conventions of this parallel universe? Because I mean, there's a sort of, there is a hint of sort of 1940s mm -hmm. about the way Mrs. Coulter dresses. Yeah. Well, First of all, um, I looked at what technology was available in Lyra's world, because it's very different to our world. And I took the, I took the invention at Bolvanger um, as something kind of 1960s, space, um, sort of space age, and so that the magisterium could feel, have more of a slightly 60s silhouette, and then kind of work back from there. So, and the, so the magisterium, this version of the church rules this world. So there would be conventions to how people dress and that all led me to kind of 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, but it shouldn't feel like any particular decade. There's things drawn from all those decades and so it should feel familiar, but not that you're actually in um, 
in that decade. And so the men have starched collars, they're more uptight because of the church, and then the women would have to have their head covered outdoors, their shoulders covered, their um, knees covered. But then we played around with that with Mrs. Coulter because Mrs. Coulter always breaks the rules. <laughs> I was saying something about the um, hair and makeup on it is that I always felt that I love the center parting on Hedy Lamarr because for me it felt slightly controlling as well. There was something I wanted to get across with her that she always had to maintain control and um, it, there was a sort of strength to her in that as well, even though it was soft and I needed her to appeal to men and children She's a master manipulator, so it's all about image. It's all about how she puts herself out there. And each room is very, she's, it's contrived. She, she's going in there to have an impact and to leave a mark. So I wanted her hair to be soft and fluffy so that kids would want to touch it. <laughs> I wanted, we were discussed about putting jewels on the, um, on the costumes or, or sort of, like shiny jewels in order, again, kids want to touch it or it's attractive. Wanted the silhouettes to be quite sexy and certainly in male dominated environments. She's breaking the rules, but she's able to get away with it. And so all those men that are oppressed, you know, as this woman come in, it's again, making an impact in that way. So there's a real sort of sense that everything's, she's controlling her image in order to have an impact and manipulate people. Uh, and that was really key. And the sort of center parting was about symmetry. It was like, I want to create a symmetrical image with her that looks a little bit weird, as well as beautiful, in a way. Um, so Hedy was a perfect kind of inspiration for her. That's fascinating about Hedy Lamar. I didn't, I didn't know that. What, what about the color palette, um, Caroline? What, I mean, talk us through that, how it's changed through, this, through the three seasons. Well, we started off um, with a sort of peacock blue outfit for many reasons, because it draws a little on the golden monkey, kind of tones with a little bit of blue that's there, but also that is that sort of a magisterium color. It's kind of an under the radar association with the magisterium color that we pepper through. We'll see a little bit, little bit more of that in series three. Um, and then Lyra is red. Her opening outfit is red, um, her burgundy red um, pinafore. But Mrs. Cooter's whole agenda in the beginning is appealing to Lyra. So her wardrobe um, in the first few episodes is all kind of aurora boreas colors, all parts, you know, the Northern Lights where Lyra wants to go. Everything has this texture to it that you want to touch. And then when Lyra disappears and Mrs. Cooter goes into red, which is Lyra's color. And then at different points, they mirror each other. So there's the famous scene where you're both in blue when the monkey attacks. And um, and then in series two, when Lara chooses an outfit, it is that kind of blue jacket. And then at times they're in the same, and um, and then at times they're completely different. Um, but yeah, so we punctuate a lot so it's with a real that sort of story arc, yes. the costumes, yeah. as, as 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 well. Um, okay, well. Um, Ruth, so that's the, the outer Mrs. Coulter, you know, this, this elegant, charismatic woman, and, the, and then the inner Mrs. Coulter, who, um, uh, as you said, is described as a cesspit of moral filth. Uh, <laughs> She's misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, um, yeah, yeah. How, do you find a, 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 how do you find a way into empathising with a character, you know, quite as ruthless and evil as that? I mean, it's always my job to find the other side of a character like that, and it wouldn't be that interesting to play for three seasons if it's just pure evil. And she never came across to me like that. She came across in the book there were mysteries about her and vulnerabilities about her. And I think, again, those key um, things came across within the relationship with the monkey. She's quite violent towards the monkey. Um, and like I said, she doesn't name him or doesn't talk to him. And that, to me, suggested a sense of shame or a sense of self-loathing. The monkey is herself in some ways, and every day she's got to exist with herself. And if she can't name herself or can't let herself speak, some part of herself can't speak, that to, to me suggests that there was some sort of level of self-loathing with her. Um, so, you know, again, I, had, I was a do, do, deep dive of working out what that might be, but that filters into every scene that 
she plays. Uh, is it like a sort of a Jekyll and Hyde thing almost? Or is it two sides of her personality? Is that how you see it? Or? Well, not necessarily. I just see it that they, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're one. So they understand, they come into the room, they understand the, every room they go into. I felt there's like a public and private side of Mrs. Coulter. And the public side is, uh, they conduct themselves really well. They're a really good team. And they can manipulate the people and the rooms they go into. But when they're at home, it's again being with oneself. It's, and whether she can bear to be with herself. So we, early on in the process, uh, well, one, we decided to have puppeteers come on, and that was a real relief for all of us, because it was like, wow, I don't have to act with a tennis ball, which was <laughs> was going to be the case at one point. <laughs> a tennis ball on a stick. A tennis ball on a stick. <laughs> stick. Um, but bringing puppeteers in and bringing someone like Brian in meant suddenly we could really explore that relationship and explore the levels of Mrs. Coulter and the psychology of her. Well, we're going to drill down into, in, in, into that and the monkeys, and we've got two short clips here which illustrate the relationship between Mrs. Coulter and, and, and the monkey, the, the two sides of her, her character, um, I, I, if you like. So if we could have that second clip now. Yeah, I was going to say, we're, so we're, we're going to talk about the puppet uh, um, uh, now because it, 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 I'm sure there's a misconception by lots of viewers that, that it was all done with special effects. It, it, but as you say, there is a puppet, much easier than acting with a tennis ball. Um, uh, uh, I mean, did that really, really help as a performer? Actually? Yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, like, it becomes a real living thing. I mean, a tennis ball is just a tennis ball. It's very hard to <laughs> believe in it. But um, when Brian would work with the puppet, it becomes a living, breathing like partner and character um, and I, I was going to say in the books it was really interesting because the book always in a way Mrs Coulter was always the sort of good version or the outward appearance the beautiful one the kind of one that seemed nice and sweet to the kids and it was the monkey that was the evil cruel dark side of her and I remember early on thinking that's not going to be that interesting to play either for me or monkey <laughs> over the course of three seasons. So actually, what you see on the screen is it's they're both quite complex, and they can both be both those things. And that's much more detailed. And as Brian and I started working together, we could find loads of levels of that. But that's why it was so essential having a puppeteer there. It felt like we could really discuss and get deep into the psychology of this character and put things on the screen, which even though we're not, they're kind of hints to Mrs. Coulter and her past. Uh, rather than explaining the story. Brian, how do you see the monkey? <sighs> this is a hard thing for me to express because I... You're both, too close. <laughs> well, no, I both live in the world of Mrs. Coulter, as in monkey. I had to accept that monkey is a part of Mrs. Coulter, so I need to feel comfortable giving ideas and expressing how I feel, which is something so alien for a puppeteer. Very often we have to be invisible. What we do is seen, but what we are is an invisible part of that. So to have to have, to, for Ruth to trust me to do that and to bring those ideas to the table is very um, embarrassing, I think is a good way to put it. 
<laughs> it's it's embarrassing because explain. <laughs> it's a very private thing. Uh, Coming from an acting background, acting is a very private thing, and the ideas that you have in your head don't always need to be talked about. You just need to have them inside of you. You need to live them. So to embody somebody else, to join somebody in the journey of making that character and making those decisions together, it's, it's a private life that I don't talk about very often either. It's, it's, Monkey is a part of me now, so I feel quite protective over him, and, um, and I really care about all the animators and the people that have put Monkey to the place that he is on screen because it's so many ideas coming together. So the puppet for me is number one on a base level, always a technical thing. When we're doing reference puppetry, it's technical. It needs to embody the space. It needs to give the actor something to work with. It needs to give camera something to see. But after that, what we were doing on this is actually creating a character which we could hand over to frame store and then they take further. So it's it's a very special middle world that I live yeah. in, so it's Frame very... being the post-production, and we're going to come to that in a minute. But yeah. I, I actually have some really exciting news. This is the last minute. This is, uh, we have an additional guest at this panel. Um, and I think Brian's going to bring out now. Yes, it's this very exciting. This is actually why everyone wants me here. That's the funny yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> da 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 <laughs> <laughs> and it is until it comes it to life. Until Brian touches it, he's dead. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who are nervous, he has been checked for monkeypox. Um, <laughs> he's gone on the health and safety, no problem. Monkey is clean. He's got this very inquiring expression, hasn't he? Look at his eyes. It's like looking at us. Ooh, He'd upstage me in every scene. <laughs> we, should also, oh, we should also talk about the magic of puppetry here because you're all looking at the monkey, aren't you? You're not looking at the massive guy next to it. <laughs> right? And that's because there's something about how puppeteers like Brian operate these things where you just want to put emotion onto the thing that they're, they're operating. It's incredible. And I don't know quite how it works. It's a bit of magic, and it's a bit of old magic, which I think is really beautiful. And the, uh, the addition of puppets came in quite sort of late into the production process, didn't it? You weren't originally going to do that. As you, I mean, what, how, did that, how did it lead to that? It was the first director was Tom Hooper, and he wanted to work out, I mean, what's so essential about these books is the demons, and work out what that demon world is and what it looks like and how we put that on screen. Um, and we were, I think he was playing around with a number of ideas, um, and then puppets. He decided actually maybe we should bring puppets in. And once he did, it was a no-brainer, I think, for everyone. For you guys, for us, because he does. Not only is it easier for us to work with as actors on the day, but it like creates a guide for the cameras. And then, of course, it's much easier for Frame Store to have a guide when they're doing it in post. So it, 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 was, a, it was a really great marriage and a really great decision, actually. So, Brian, how do you work with Ruth? on set, I mean, in terms of sort of movement and so on? Well, Early on when we were rehearsing, we uh, had to go through the ideas of what it was to have a demon, which specifically is an animal. So what are simian movements? What does that, <laughs> should I put monkey away for now? Is this, is this no, too? No. <laughs> um, he doesn't speak, shut up monkey. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we played around with lots of ideas of uh, how to move and where the crossover is between the monkey and Mrs. Coulter when those different um, embodiments take over between them because they share sometimes when they're far apart, there's, a, there's a, a depression. And I don't just mean emotional depression. I mean there is an, a, a emo, uh, an energy depression. So the playing around between distance and closeness when they're trying to be on guard they need to be close and they need to be quite um, engaged with everyone so we played around being monkeys on the floor together which was again a, a good <laughs> yeah well, both you and Ruth pretending to be monkeys yeah is there, is there video footage of this because I'd like to not thank a god no <laughs> No. Was it was lots it was of David a, Attenborough watched? A little bit of that, yeah. yeah. No, we spent, it was the week before we started, sh maybe a week or two weeks before we started shooting. You guys already started shooting. I came on a month into the shoot and we got together in a room and I think, 
I wanted to bring some monkey moves in because I just thought there's something, if the monkey's your demon, there must be something in you physically that comes out sometimes. And we also wanted to play, I wanted to get our dynamic and our energy between each other. So we were literally in a room sort of playing with each other and being in a space together. And trying to, it's, it's very, it it's mime. very drama school. And mime, this, but I mean, presumably, because the monkey, you know. Yeah, you know, mime. mime. Yeah, yeah so talking, yeah. Brian would teach me monkey moves, um, which were just very, very subtle. Can you give us an example of a monkey move? You, you, yeah. So right, this is where Brian comes in. <laughs> uh, for example, if if we were in a scene and she was getting very emotional and she she said, "I, I need some, I need something extra," then uh, when going to pick up a water, instead of picking up a water as this. You would just find something loose in the wrist. So that kind of when uh, when a monkey or an ape is doing something, there's there's a looseness. So instead, just grabbing it from here, which is controlling and looks a bit strange and odd and alien. So it, it gives it that difference. Or spreading the legs rather than being in a proper pose, you could you could be in a much more powerful position. And there's one where. Uh, I think in moments of vulnerability, like the foot goes to the side, which is sort of what monkeys do as well. It's been found the sort of their feet kind of fall in. So you have to look out for it, but there's moments within the show that I'm doing those things, yeah. which give me, it gives me something else to play, but also it's reflective of something emotional going on with her. Um, so it was all those really wonderful discoveries that we were finding. And we also felt it was like, wasn't it tension between the two of us? So the idea of tension, which again comes from theater and working on in space with another actor. But it's the idea of how, you know, if you're close or there's some kind of energy between you. And we were working with that in a room. So the idea that there must have been something between them. I feel that the, the demon can separate from her, which is again, unusual. And only other witches can do that. And as you find out in another season, Lyra has to learn to separate from her demon. And so we think, well, Mrs. Coulter must have done that some process in her life, which is, it's agony. So there's trauma there. It's massive it? trauma. So again, it was about how the two of us had learned to separate. And then when we come back together, is it the same or is the mistrust or is there something else going on there? So when we were in a room, we were working out what they feel like when they're close together. And it felt like there was a tension, there was an alertness, there was a slight anger or resentment between the two of them. When they were distant, they felt flat and de-energized. And so that helped us work out in a public and private setting how they were together. Publicly, they were alert, they're on, you know, on show. And they, they were kind of energized and direct. When they're at home, they were separate, they couldn't be in each other's space, and they were more de-energized and flat and slightly depressed. So it kind of helped us work out how in those scenes to conduct ourselves, physically and emotionally. I'm interested, Brian, that you were, you were an actor beforehand. Presumably that kind of really helps with this part, being a, both a puppeteer and an actor. Yeah, well, one of the nicest days on set is when we were doing a very emotional scene, and I, it was... Um, it was one of the moments, one of the first moments that we see Mrs. Coulter and Monkey come together and actually share a moment that's not undermined by something else impeding or Mrs. Coulter changing her mind. And at the end of the day, Ruth just said, oh, it's, it, you're just a fantastic actor. And I thought, oh, all right, <laughs> <sighs> money well spent then. <laughs> oh, he is. And it's like, I loved our scenes. It was the best bit for me of the whole show was working with my monkey. And, <laughs> and we'd sort of, we'd, approach each scene it's like right Bri what are we going to do today so it's like you know there's other things happening in the scene but really for me the focus was right what are monkey and I doing yeah. and so we'd collaborate on every scene and even if monkey didn't end up featuring in that scene he was present for me which is essential to that character I mean there's not a scene that I don't know where monkey is and where I was sat basically because every single scene I was within five feet of of being able to speak to Ruth, so everything would be discussed and I would be hiding somewhere. I can tell you in all the scenes where I'm hiding. What's gonna happen to Monkey now you've shot the final series? So we have to wait and see. <laughs> Good and bad. I may have to ask Monkey's agent. Yeah. Um, so, so. He's coming with me everywhere I go. <laughs> um, Russell Dodson, let's talk about uh, building the Monkey in post-production, because what we see on the screen 
is is created in in in, in special effects, isn't it? In Framestore. It is indeed. Yeah, it's a kind of a recreation of the work that these guys do. Yeah. Now I think we have a clip of the monkey being uh, created, and we're, we're going to watch. Uh, I want you to to talk us through it. Um, and this is the, the monkey being built. You know, for, and how you find this sort of palette of expressions and face shape, face, face shapes, because you've got to hit that familiarity, haven't you, between it both being sort of human and being an, an animal. So I think we'll keep the house lights up. I'm going to sort of talk over this. Yeah, try and look away while talking forwards. So um, <laughs> when we make it, we have to get really anatomical. So we end up with something that really operates like a monkey. So we actually start from the skeleton upwards. And we have a really amazing team of fundamentally like mathematicians who work out how you can rig all the bones so that it operates exactly like a real animal. And then we have another team of people who then apply all the muscles. And we have to make sure that all the muscles preserve their size and scale when they flex and bend. Because you can see the muscles shifting around under the skin, which you can see now. Um, so we have to make sure all of that stuff works so that you don't get lost in wondering why something looks strange. And then the hardest part is when we add the fur. Um, so what we do is we start with a sort of a limited amount of fur because it's too much to deal with. And we actually have people that genuinely give the monkey a haircut and a hairbrush in a computer and every single twist and knot and matted part is a choice it's a choice about how we want that monkey to look and then eventually we fill all the fur in so you get the full density of an actual creature which is there and fur is amazing because actually like we have to also work out the fact that light with every hair you have on your on your head light either travels through it bounces off it or goes into it bounces around and comes back out and those three things give you the look of fur so when you look at something like this, the amount of love that goes into it to make it respond to light so it looks like it's in the scene and to make all the fur move and simulate against the muscles that are moving underneath it and the bones is phenomenal. And that's before we even do a shot. It's, a real, it's like a proper deep dive. And there you could see the way the monkey and Mrs. Coulter were sort of walking almost, you know, I mean, in tandem, but... Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the big takeaway for me on the show, apart from sitting here and realising how unbelievably fortunate I think I feel to be working with these guys when I hear them talk, it's amazing, um, is the biggest and most exciting challenge of this show, which I found out very quickly when starting, is the duty of care that we have to, to the cast. So if you... Uh, uh, what do you to, mean by that? Okay, so if you have Ruth Wilson, who just brings the A game constantly and is incredible and doing a lot of really emotive work. And your job is to stick a monkey in the shot with her. After sticking a person next to her the whole time. Exactly. You can, like, I suddenly realize that if me and my team do our jobs incorrectly, we can undermine Ruth's work rather than what I consider to be f sort of flavoring or seasoning on the scenes. Um, so what we end up doing is we end up having... I have very much, you know, if you imagine on set, there is very much a kind of an actor-director relationship. And when we get back to the studio, that starts again. So we, we first we have to look at the scenes, and I have to remind myself, especially because when you edit a scene, sometimes the meaning or tone of a edit, an edit can change the meaning and tone of a scene. But then what I have to do is I have to sit down and I have to remind myself, in the same way that I think you guys do, of what everybody's goals are in a scene. What's Mrs. Coulter trying to get out of other people? And then what I then have to do is I have to take Brian's, the mannerisms, because obviously we don't have like a moving face and moving expressions and all the details of a monkey. But what you have is you have something when you look at it. And it's the amazing thing about puppeteering is that there is a, um, it's a bit like when you look at like the eye of a cow. You could show someone the picture of an eye of a cow twice and say it's a sad cow or a happy cow and we put the emotion onto it. So what I have to do is I have to take what Brian's done, see what that makes me feel, I have to see what Ruth's doing and see what I think she's trying to get out of the scene. And I also have to knowing, because me and me, Ruth and Brian did a whole deep dive conversation after filming. So, 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 so Ruth came into frame store, comes in, came into post-production as well, which you wouldn't normally do as an actor, would you? Ever? No, I've never done that before. And you never usually see the process of that as an actor. You kind of just, you finish your job when you go home and leave it to them to do the edit. But and what, um, what, how could you add to that process? You're sitting there, you're seeing the monkey on screen. You sort of say, actually, can you make the monkey look a bit angrier here? Or no, that? we just talked about the psychology. We okay. talked about what Brian had done in every scene, how we'd approached it, what we were trying to get across, what was going on underneath. Again, even if it wasn't completely clear and explicit on the screen was what we were doing. And that gave, we recorded it, didn't we? We sat down for how many hours and went through 
all the scenes, I think, or a lot of the scenes, and explained what we were trying to do in those scenes. So then it gave Russell and his team a guide as to what what the intention of that scene was. Yeah, so we shared that whole recording with my animators, who we work with. And then what I do is I kind of, when I brief them, instead of saying, put that leg here, put that leg there, I, I offer them up a perspective on the scene based on all of this knowledge. And they've also listened to Ruth's perspective on the entire character and Brian's. And they offer me back a performance. And I say whether I think the energy or the tone or the rhythm of the thing is correct to kind of, and, and actually a lot of the time, most of my notes are take stuff away. Like, we, like we're not here to dominate the scene. We're here to be part of the scene and we're here to add a touch of subtext if we can. Now, I think, I think we, need to cue, we need to watch another scene actually here. Um, and this is from season two and it's Mrs. Coulter having confronted Lee Scoresby, played by Lin-Manuel Miranda, in his prison cell. Um, and, and I think this will help explain a little actually how Brian and Ruth work together. So if we could have that uh, clip now. I will rip out every nail and I will break every bone. And it won't break me and you know it won't because it wouldn't break you either. You can threaten me, torture me, but I will never tell you where Lyra is because my life is worth one tenth of her. been a long time since you talked about him. I know. You did good. Fascinated by monkey putting putting his hand up there and hold, like, can you talk us through that? Is that? There's a few moments in the earlier clip as well of me ripping up the pillow in the room. There's a few clips that come from again a a sort of psychological um, understanding of Mrs. C that I had to place on the character. I wouldn't. I don't think Philip would necessarily agree with this background story but I had to find some truth to her and I felt there was something interesting that there had been a trauma in Mrs C's life at some time when she was young and because of the whole books which deal with sin redemption and a child's sexual becoming with Lyra growing into a sexual age I thought it there must be something about abuse with her and whether it's sexual or it's violent or it's Vo uh, vocal or verbal abuse I thought there must have been something in Mrs C's life I didn't wasn't specific about where that came from but I thought that kind of filtered into some of our scenes and again it wasn't explicit it was just my kind of way in to her it made sense of Bulvanger it made sense of why she wanted to separate demons from children because she felt the demon was the sin it made sense of why she had that relationship with Monkey she kind of hated herself. There was shame attached to herself and there was self-loathing attached to herself. So it, it kind of made sense of all that. So some of these scenes slightly reference that, which again, in not an explicit way. So the bedroom scene, we had a scene that both Brian and I sort of came up with the logic of this scene that she's angry about loss of Lyra, of like failing in a way and lacking control. And there's something in the bedroom that seemed quite weird. And so we had Monkey almost representing a sort of, whatever, male version coming into the scene, closing the door, and she's ripping the pillow up. It's quite dark, but it gave, it lent something that, again, was mysterious, that an audience might go, what's that about? And we never tell them really what it's about, but that's 
clues to who she is. And then in this scene, again, it seems quite childlike that she's looking at the wall. I thought there was something about child trauma with her. So that we wanted this Lynn manuel in that, in that scene is talking about his father being abusive to him. And he says, you know, you know, you've been there, you understand, or something. So, again, it was the idea of going back to some sort of trauma in Mrs. C. And Monkey is there at that moment, leaning and being a comfort to her. Um, and she accepts it for the first time, or one of the first times. Often she bats it away. She doesn't want to be close to him or to herself. Um, in this moment, she actually connects. And it's that's the start of the journey of their, in a way, their reconciliation throughout the next season too. I suppose actually, I mean, what's interesting about Monkey compared to Lyra's demon is, of course, Monkey doesn't talk. Yeah. Which I guess makes both of you, your, your jobs kind of even more important because it's all done in the movement, isn't it, really? And the, and the expressions. This is why I feel strange talking about it in real life because <laughs> there is an amount of that that has been taken on into my body rather than my voice. I don't have to, exp I don't express myself through thoughts. Even when we would talk through scenes or when we would talk through what was happening, often what I do is I would just go, well, it's kind of like when you, and that's sort of the language that I would just use. And they would go, oh, yeah, yeah, we get it. Okay, fine. Yeah, great. We can go with that. Um, but it, it's pretty weird. <laughs> I mean, I'm a puppeteer. What, was, what does so. that mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, so. But he's right about, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt, but he's right about t saying this stuff to you because it's actually it's very personal. And I wouldn't, you know, in some ways, you have to find, we all have to find ways into a character to give story and depth and give a journey and it's quite vulnerable telling you those things because they're not necessarily they're not what philip necessarily wrote but it was a way to access and to create a mystery and give depth to those characters so in some ways it's like asking us to reveal and we are here revealing sort of the secrets of what we do behind the scenes which you may or may not agree with but it's how we created it um and so that's it's it's interesting revealing that it does feel a bit vulnerable <laughs> doesn't it saying what we do and how we accessed it. I think the thing, oh, sorry. I think the yeah. thing about having a limited palette as well is really exciting. Like if you strip away certain things that you can work with, it really makes, it's a bit like when you, when you hear about people who have lost a sense and it heightens all the other senses. And that's, so, so the way that I have to work with my team is I think very alien to the way that I think Ruth would see it. But I, I, I sort of have to break a performance down into different things. So I, the way I discuss it with my animators is I break a performance down to body acting, head acting, and face acting. Yeah. Because when I animate anything, whether a character is talking or not, to be honest, I always turn the sound off. And I go, can I understand what this character is saying or feeling by body language? Because we, we recognize body language. We recognize a slight move forwards or a slight pull back or a slight cock of the head and all these very tiny details. And actually, the thing I care least about in all the characters is their face. Because if, we, if you're trying to take a, an animal you know, and turn it into a character without breaking the kind of the, the sense of reality that it's still an animal. You have to be very, very, very delicate. So we start with the body, and I'm like, okay, does the body feel like it's a questioning body, or does the body feel like it's a curious body? And then I go, right, now how do we accent that with a little bit more with the head? And then eventually we go, right, now let's bring the face in so that we don't have to do too much with it, because it's the face that can hit the uncanny valley really quickly. So I have to... I, I mean, I, I'm sure that's very strange Avoid for you. Avoid my face. <laughs> you just have to, it's, it's the idea of working like from the opposite end, basically, yeah. to, try, to try fundamentally to do it with as little as possible. So that again, we don't upstage anyone. We don't, we don't go off on a different tangent and we allow the audience when watching it to put their emotion onto yeah. it as much as we're trying to give them a hint of what to feel. Yeah. Which is so interesting because that's what a puppet is. It's a neutral face, it's a neutral mask that you cast your emotions onto, so there's project onto it's it, very yeah. special. That process that you showed us that on, on screen of developing the monkey, putting the hair on, I mean, how long does all that take? Um, I can't give you the numbers for that. When but, we did the bear, Yorick, yeah. if one person sat down to make, to do that stage, which isn't animating anything, you don't even have yeah. a shot to look at by the end of it. If one person sat down to make Yorick, we worked it out to be about 280 days of work. I mean, this is the thing that this is the thing that like this opportunity is always my favorite thing because I get to tell people that visual effect does not involve pressing a button. 
There is not a, there, there is not an eyebrow move on a monkey that happens without someone making a choice and then moving it. It's no different. It is no different. Well, it, I mean, hang on. It's very different, but it's it's analogous to Ruth deciding to raise an eyebrow to do something. Like someone has to choose it, which is why you know. I love Yorick, by the way. <laughs> He's like you know. I think great, most people's dream husband. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the the. Um, I mean, I if to be honest, if he rocked up, I'd be like, I'd look at my wife, I'd look at Yorick, and I'd be like, I don't know, I don't know. It's a tough call. Um, These two actually, they used to do fights, bear fights. <laughs> I wonder where the footage of that the is. Worst. They have to. <laughs> They'd, have, they'd work out the bear fights and they'd have to do it physically themselves first. They loved it. There was a lot of tussling going on. A lot of tussling yeah, between those two. This, 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 working out the physicality like of bears. Set, like I've you know, people pretending to be monkeys, pretending to be bear fights. I, so it's just absolutely, yeah. I can tell you this. There's nothing quite as like sort of arresting as watching the video of like yourself, who's not a fine physical specimen, wrestling a, like a ripped stunt guy <laughs> and going like, yeah. I need to. <laughs> <laughs> I need to hit the gym pretty pretty. Well, I think we, we need to see a fight now, don't we, I think? Um, so cool. so here is a clip of Mrs. Coulter and the monkey from season one attacking the Egyptian boy in her apartment. Remember that very dramatic scene? <laughs> oh. 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 To escape me. Who sent you, Egyptian boy? Can I just yeah. say something about this? Because as a crew working on the show, you know, we'd see all the puppeteers on set. We, you know, Russell wandering about. <laughs> but we didn't know what it, what it was going to be like. And then I think that's the first scene that you showed the crew, that Russ got that together and he showed the crew, right, this is what it's going to be. And I mean... Did that make a complete difference to you? It's yeah, like yeah, because it was just incredible, absolutely incredible. And, you know, as a crew behind the scenes to get to see that and know, wow, this is going to be good. Um, it was brilliant. Actually, just seeing that amazing Art Deco apartment that Mrs. Coulter lives in. <laughs> I mean, presumably when you're designing the costumes, that comes into it as well, doesn't it? That the, the surroundings, it's got the costumes have got to go with the monkey, with the character, with the set? Yeah, well, Joel, the production designer, he wanted the, the apartment to feel really controlled as well, a very controlled 
um, environment. So it's mostly sort of marble and quite cold. And then he would come and get um, sort of samples of the fabrics that I was using. And then there's there's a scene when you're in the blue dress with um, McVeil and they picked out all the same colours in the painting. So it's it's just as controlled as it could be. I was initially scared because, I, like I said, I thought I was going to have to act with a tennis ball. And I thought, I've never done that. I, that sounds awful. Um, and it's I'm going to be bad at it. But obviously, like I said, when Brian came on, when the puppeteers came on, and then when you meet the whole team, no, it was a joy. And it was, a, like I said, the best bit about the whole show for me. Yeah, I always thought, I mean, that's why she's so fascinating. She is uh, a villainous mother, and that's really hard to see on the screen, I suppose. And it's, for me, it was about finding out why a bit, or suggesting why, and then seeing moments of vulnerability with her, so that you can, even if she's so horrific, you can slightly empathize, or you can, you know, there's some bits about her, you realize, wow, there's, um, there's a reason why she's like this. That's always really vital for me, and that's where you're going to find a really complex character on screen and how to put one on there. But I loved how quickly she could shift. And that conflict, as soon as Lyra comes into her life, everything goes out the window. She thinks she can control this kid. And like probably most parents, your kids are the thing that really challenge you the most because you they reflect yourself or you see parts of yourself in them and they constantly surprise you. Uh, and you adore them and at the same time get really frustrated by them. So I think that she didn't quite understand what she was dealing with when she thought she could take on her daughter. I don't actually know what that means, so for the uninitiated, can you just explain? Yeah, sure. Um, the, 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 sort of the process of shooting visual effects, I mean, really what we try and do is not be in the way, but the truth is, is when you have to do something this complex, um, it's kind of hard not to be. So we have this process uh, that we do um, where Brian will go in and he will do what we call the puppet pass, right, which is where we establish the rules of the scene and we, um, and, and you know, get a few good takes working where everybody knows what's getting, going on and they've got their muscle memory and they've got their eye lines. And then what we do is we cruelly take the puppet away and um, either replace it with a little eye line sort of thing or we, um, nothing. And... Hopefully the idea is by then... Everybody has to do it all over again. Absolutely. Um, that's why we try and keep the puppet pass to a minimum. Um, but the, um, and then what happens is that means that what we don't have to do is a, like a really complicated thing, which sounds very mundane, but if you've got a puppeteer standing in a room with a fireplace casting shadows all over the room, if you, you can get rid of the puppet, but you can't get rid of the shadows, and then you put something in and everyone's like, why is there like a shadow of a dude on the wall? <laughs> right? So, 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 so it, 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 that's how you can end up... You know, on a show like this, our duty is to get as much character on screen as possible. And I'm not going to surprise anyone by saying that visual effects cost money. Um, so what we have to do is we have to try and be as efficient as we can so that actually we're doing the stuff that's important and not the stuff that's mindless. So fundamentally, we, we, set, a, we set a series of rules, which by, I'd say, like week two, the directors were saying, OK, we need to do this pass and this pass and this pass. And to be honest, in the end, we probably use about 60% clean pass and 40% we just paint Brian out. Be because I want to make it very clear that we can't do our jobs if fundamentally Ruth doesn't feel like she's managed to find the most truthful performance because otherwise, you know, we could put it in and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So this trio is the reason why we get to do our jobs properly and our job is just to try and give you guys the most unobstructed route to it. And there are some moments when you, sort of physical moments, things like touching the monkeys really hard because, again, the imprint or the shadow or the fur is very difficult to then paint afterwards. So it would be so odd, wasn't it? It was like trying to stroke a monkey's head and you have to sort of do a vague thing when it's not there. You know, it's, kind of, it's a weird process, but these guys make it look easy afterwards. So it's... Um, they cover up any of my bad. And backstage, we do also have the special grey sock, which has held many a prop oh, for monkeys. The grey sock. sock. The grey sock. sock. I think we it's... spotted the grey sock. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't, yeah. Strangely, the more technical it gets, the cheaper the thing Brian uses yeah. gets. <laughs> so it's like if Ruth has to like give the monkey something, it's like, you've got the grey sock, Brian. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> Um, 
That's Actually, it's quite interesting because which season is it? This season? Yeah, yes. this season. We make a reference to her mother. Um, and so Caroline can answer this question as two because we actually have some sort of outfits that uh, are her mother's that are sent to Mrs. Coulter. So I, in my head, it's linked up to the magisterium and the church and that she is, I think, Mrs. Coulter's mother was very much part of the church. So actually represents for her kind of rules and patriarchy and... And I think that Mrs. Coulter was always uh, a disappointment to her mother in that way. Um, but you'll see that my reaction to those outfits is not necessarily very nice. You know? <laughs> I'm being reminded of my mother again and her power and her influence. Can you tell us about the outfits or without giving too much away? Or is that... Well, I think without giving too much away, I Might think have already done that. she's... Um, <laughs> no, I think it's all right. Um, <laughs> that... I think for her mother is meant to be incredibly religious, but also I think very much about appearance. So I think this whole facade of appearance um, comes from her mother. And we have, so there's a moment where some, this outfit's meant to encompass a lot of what we've seen before. Yeah. Um, so we've got half the people that create Mrs. Coulter on, on the stage here, but there's also, of course, the writers and um, and the editors and everyone else involved. So what was great about season two was in the book, Mrs. Coulter doesn't feature much, actually, but the writers and the producers wanted to put her in and keep her connected to Lyra throughout that journey in season two. So it was like... Okay, and, Philip gave us license to explore her meeting other characters, which was brilliant. And they were the most exciting scenes actually in season two for me. It was because we could kind of have more play with it and discover what that might be. Um, and of course, Mrs. Malone or Mary Malone, we had to work out what Mrs. Coulter now looks like in Will's world, which was really fun. And how in contrast, what she sees in Will's world that she doesn't have in her own. And actually, does that inform how she is throughout the rest of the season and in season three? That she's learned things from in there about um, society that she doesn't have in her own. Um, so that was fascinating. And Caroline can talk to what that outfit looked like. And then with Lee as well, that was great fun because, again, we explored the psychology of these two characters and what they shared. Um, and they would never usually meet. So it was really fun. I got to work with Lynn and a big fan of his so that was all down to really Jack and the producers and Philip who allowed us to kind of explore the dynamic of those relationships so um, Mrs. Coulter crosses into our world and Boreal has supposedly bought this selection of clothing not quite knowing what she <laughs> would wear um, but we wanted to keep we wanted to keep the essence of Mrs. Coulter so you know, she needs a shoulder, and um, and she's only uh, before then. You've only really worn trousers at home. Um, so I thought, well, obviously, in our world, Mrs. Coulter would wear Alexander McQueen. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's what she wore. Should I do puppets first? You, you do puppets. I'll, I'll cry puppets. for a little bit yeah, yeah, and then right. we can talk about it. Um, so puppets-wise, uh, essentially the way that the direction would go is that Ruth and I would have a discussion about what was happening per scene, so we'd get an idea of what we wanted and what we thought should be happening. Um, often I would then go to Russ or one of the VFX supervisors on set and say, what do we have money for? Literally, how many shots per the demons do we have? Because sometimes we'd have, okay, you can have three shots in wide, you can have two shots in close, and that's it. You can't go any more than that. No interaction, Brian. No interaction, no interaction. Please, no interaction. <laughs> so then that would get brought onto set. We would do the first passes because I was supervising all of the puppeteering. I would get to feed that in. Um, Ruth and I would make sure that we were happy and directors would give any notes that they have and we would just tailor that all together. So that's essentially the, the working process between Ruth and I, then going to VFX, making sure we can accomplish it and then getting direction from the directors and making sure it lives within that world and lights and camera and everything else technically. Yeah, um, yeah it's going all right. 
Um, I mean, it's tricky. I mean, like, the, if, if you ever want to get stitched up, read the description of the Malefa in the book and then go, cool, let's have a go. Um, it's going well. I mean, you know, I think everything is about adaptation and, you know, when you're doing this and, and taking the essence of what something is. Um, if we did exactly what is described in the book, you probably wouldn't want to watch it um, because it would just be too weird. And there's a sort of a certain um, grace and elegance about them that we need to try and find. And that's what we're currently doing day in, day out, until October. There was a bit of a process of working out how would the move, and I was somewhat concerned at one point that a, Elliot would have broken limbs. I mean, yeah, it, uh, there was a point, okay, so for those that don't know, they're like a kind of sort of like giant horse, trunked horse animal that has a diamond-shaped skeleton. It doesn't. Um, and um, and uh, also rolls around on wheels, so there's no problem with that. Um, and at one point, one of our puppeteering team turned up with a Malefa puppet head on the end of a bike and went, what do you reckon? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a cool idea, but someone's going to die. So we, um, we, we, we didn't do that, but it's going fine. I mean, it's a cool challenge and we'll sort of, you know, we'll disappoint some people and make other people really happy, I guess. That tease up the final season perfectly. I'm afraid we have run out of time. So I'd just like to thank you, the audience and my wonderful panel for explaining the creation of Mrs. Coulter to us so well. Thank you.